The far right in Germany won their first major election since World War II. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is coming under his heaviest pressure to quit since the October 7th attacks last year. And politicians in Britain and America are increasingly siding in that conflict with Hamas. We'll talk about all this and more on today's Trumpet World. Welcome back to Trumpet World. I'm joined today, as usual, for our Friday show by our guest, Mihailo Zekic, here in the room with me, and Jeremiah Jacques and Andrew Miller in the United States. Our top story today is a European story. Uh, I had to uh, be a little discourteous, I guess, and put myself first this week because I think it is something we do need to talk about right off the bat. And that is that the extremes have come to a really high level, a stunning level in some ways of success in Germany. So this weekend, they had two state elections in Thuringia or Thuringia uh, and in Saxony. So if we look at the uh, Thuringia election first, the alternative for Deutschland came in first place. So they won about a third of the vote. The Christian Democratic Union came in second. And then in third and fourth place were basically two far left parties that are offshoots of the old East German Communist Party. So that is quite a startling result. I mean, if you look at these different parties, so the alternative for Deutschland, the party that won. I had an article in the August 2004, this year, Trumpet print edition, that goes through some of who this party is, where this is a party that at least they have the guts to stand up for to the mainstream when it comes to immigration. And when it comes to the migrant crisis in Germany, they'll talk about it when so many other countries won't. Uh, and they want to take care of that problem. At the same time, though, they also have a very different view of Germany's history, particularly World War II history. And they have a very different view for the German nation. Bjorn Hucke, one of their top leaders, he's called Germany's attempts to kind of commemorate and apologize for World War II, a stupid coping policy. Uh, and he's condemned Germany for building a Holocaust memorial. Uh, another of their leaders, Alexander Gowland, he's said that we have the right to be proud of the achievement of the German soldiers in two world wars. You've you've had another of their leaders, Tino Chaparella. He said, I find it fundamentally problematic to always link commemoration with the question of guilt. Uh, and he said historical guilt should no longer uh, determine the way that we act. So this is a party that wants, has a very different vision for Germany. And the vision, its vision of Germany's past is a part of that. Uh, and it's a vision for a Germany that is not restrained for it by its past and that is putting its power kind of in an unrestrained way on the world, going back to being a major military power again. That is the party that came in first place in Thur Thuringia or Thuringia or Thuringen and came in a very narrow second place in Saxony. Milo, I think you, were, you had something you wanted to add about that party. Yeah, so that region, Thuringia, that was actually one of the um, first starting grounds, you could say, of the Nazi movement back in the 1920s and 30s, where Hitler started getting some of his early voting support as Germany was going through an electoral crisis. It's also a former part of East Germany. And what gets me, or boggles my mind at least, is leading up to this election, Everybody was on edge about, you know, the status quo is going to get destroyed, that we're getting into uncharted waters. The, the state leader there was already a member of one of those parties you mentioned, of the old East German Communist Party, Die Linke. Uh, he hasn't necessarily turned Thuringia into a Stasi uh, spy state, but at the same time, that dam's already been broken just with that. And the fact that we're continuing down from, in this case, from far left to far right shows that, I mean, it's not the end of the story and there's going to be worse coming. Right. I think I think the left wing parties are absolutely worth talking about as well, that we've got. The, OK, the alternative for Deutschland, this quite extreme fringe right party that's in first place is huge and super remarkable. But it is worth, I think, looking at these parties that came in third place 
and fourth place. So in fourth place, talk about them first is this D-Linker group that is, yeah, the, the kind of the modern successor to the East German Communist Party. And they are very radical left in terms of pot, like Bernie Sanders is conservative left in terms of commun uh, communism and, and some of their far left policies. They have been ruling in, co in, in coalition, so they've not been able to uh, implement all of those the way that they would like, but they are quite extreme there. They're also very extreme in their foreign policy. And this is where they have a commonality with the alternative for Deutschland, where they, they want Germany out of NATO, the alternative for Deutschland. They also see you know, they, they, the alternative for Deutschland, see America as fundamentally an enemy state, basically. And NATO is something that enslaves Germany, that that keeps them tied into this alliance structure that they don't want to be in um, and stops them from kind of spreading their wings internationally the way that they were they would like. And that brings me to this this party that came in third place. Uh, and that is basically it, it, it's just named after their most prominent leader. It's called the party of Sarah Wagenacht. She quit Die Linke and she formed this party. And it very much brings these kind of two sides together. So it is far left economic policies. What she's done, I think she is perhaps one of the cleverest politicians in the world right now. Uh, so she ditched a lot of green policies. So she's in a lot of countries, environmentalist policies have been a fantastic way to sneak in socialist policies or get them in by the back door. You know, this, this James Denning Paul coined this phrase, watermelons. It's green on the outside. It's red on the inside. It's all about finding an excuse for socialism. But some of these environmentalist policies, they push your fuel prices high. They push your energy prices high and they hurt the poor most of all. And so she her point is, well, we need to dip, ditch that. Forget about like just focus on go for the, the communism, the equality, ditch the green, the environmentalism. And then where she really breaks with the left party is she's also very much anti-immigration. So worldwide, immigration is generally seen as a left wing issue. And she said, no, we there's if you're standing up for the working classes, well, they're really hurt by mass migration and the importation of tons of cheap labor. We're going to oppose that as well. Uh, and so she's been drawing support supporters from both the left and the right and, and people even that used to vote for the AFD that she's picked up some of their vote. Uh, and so she was in third place. But what I think is really interesting with all of these, so the Christian Democratic Union that came in second, this is the mainstream right party. This is the kind of the equivalent of Germany's Republican Party. They've said, we will not work with the alternative for Deutschland. They are too extreme. We are not going to do business with them. Also, we will not work with the left party. They're the former East German Communist Party in new clothing. We will not work with them. Sarah Wagenknecht's party is a successor to that. We will not work with her either. And she was the one, and, and especially because she opposes aid to Ukraine. That was one of the big red lines for the Christian Democratic Party. Other groups like the Social Democrats used to take a similar view. They used to have what was called a firewall. Uh, they compromised and have started working with the left quite a few years ago uh, on a more local level. So you can already see some of this eroding. But you have this situation where these these three extreme parties, whether they're far left or far right, and in a way, I think these are the labels that we're stuck with because they're the ones that most people understand. They're not necessarily the best. But these two parties between them got over 60% of the vote. And what's the, how do you govern Turinger now? Like, what is the Christian Democratic Union going to do if they're saying, well, 60% of the parties, we're not going to work with them? So they're under a lot of pressure now to either compromise the firewall. And of these three, uh, the Sarah Wagenknecht is considered to be the least extreme. Her husband is, is uh, Oscar Lafontaine. I think he's still her husband. He was a very major social Democrat politician. So she does have some ties to kind of some bit more mainstream parties. So there's pressure for them to compromise this firewall. There's even some saying, well, actually, they should go into coalition with the alternative for Deutschland. So you've got now this state that's ungovernable. But also, what does it say about the current state of German politics that almost two thirds of voters voted for parties that the that at least this one mainstream party says, nah, they're too extreme. We're not even going to work with them. And that shows a lot of Germans do not like where their country is right now. And they are willing to take quite radical steps to change. I mean, this is almost 
the equivalent of voting libertarian or for Ralph Nedler or, or you know, some of these minor American politicians that never, you know, RFK. It's kind of almost the equivalent of doing that. But 60 percent have now done that. It's a complete overturn in German politics. So we talk about Saxony. It's a similar picture there. So the CDU managed to eke out a win. They got 31.9 percent of the vote, whereas the AFD got 30.6 percent. But again, the extremes combined in in Saxony, they got 46.9 percent of the vote. And that translates into 51 percent of the seats. So once again, the extreme parties, they have a, a majority within Sax No one can form a government in Saxony without compromising with one of these parties. And if you go if we go back to uh, uh, to Thuringia or Thuringia, I, I always get the German and English pronunciations confused and then kind of merge the two together and do something even weirder. Um, but there, by themselves, the alternative for Deutschland hold a blocking minority. They have a third of the seats. So certain things like the appointment of judges or calling fresh elections, calling early elections, they require a two thirds majority and the AFD can block that. I mean, these states are, are close to ungovernable. What happens when this repeats itself on a national scale, when we hold national elections soon? I mean, the opinion polls, yes, I think, you know, Simon, or behind you, you made a great point that that the Turinger is it's a bit of an unusual state. It is this this kind of this or, or always been a bit more extreme. And East Germany itself, with its economic problems, is often more extreme and more prone to these fringes than uh, than kind of the, the mainstream of Germany. They they have these issues, but it's not too different for the German federal election. If you look at opinion polls, you could have something not quite that extreme, but broadly, broadly similar. This is something Trumpet editor-in-chief Joe did an excellent article in the August Trumpet print edition, Nazism Rises Again in Germany. I mean, that article was based on the AFD coming in second. And now they've come in first in a major election. And uh, he wrote in that article, the rise of the Nazi spirit in Europe is sobering. It certainly shows how the climate is ripe for the rise of this strongman. We'll talk about that. Well, let's talk about that now. That has been a keynote prophecy of, of the Trumpet and of the plain truth before us, that Daniel chapter eight is a passage of Bible prophecy that tells us that there'll be a strong man. Jesus Christ himself referenced Daniel, this part of Daniel, Daniel chapter eight and Daniel chapter 11. You know, he, he told his disciples, well, when you see you know, this abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, the prophet, he told you know, Jesus Christ told his followers, you need to understand the prophecy that is in the book of Daniel. You know, then you need to you need to get ready to flee. And you know, he went on to talk about world events around that. But he's saying we need to understand this. And that part of the book of Daniel is talking about a strong man. Well, it, it, it's it's prophecy that everyone can see was fulfilled in a strong man that ruled the Seleucid Empire hundreds of years after Daniel wrote. And that man's name was Antiochus Epiphanes. But Jesus Christ referenced that same part of Daniel and said, no, you need to look for this to happen again in the future. Antiochus Epiphanes, this ancient guy that was prophesied by Daniel, is just a forerunner. There is a coming future strongman. And so you can go back to just the years, the months, the days after the end of World War II. And Herbert W. Armstrong was saying, watch for the rise of a strongman to come along in Germany. And after he died, Mr. Flurry very quickly was sounding that same message watch for the rise of this strongman and so that's you know we're seeing the events in germany right now paving the way for that rise of that strongman where voters are saying we are done with all of the mainstream parties you know two-thirds of voters almost in this one particular state saying now your mainstream politics we don't want it we want something fundamentally different a third of them are voting for this afd party that, I mean, here's another quote. This was Maximilian Kra. Mr. Floyd drew attention to this in his, his August article where you know, the, the Nuremberg trial said that the Waffen SS were a criminal organization because of its involvement in the Holocaust. He disagreed. He'd say, I, never I would never say that anyone who wore an SS uniform was automatically a criminal. He ended up kind of, he said that in the run up to the last election that they held and they still came second despite those kind of statements. There was another leader who's been repeatedly prosecuted for using neo-Nazi slogans. 
And again, this is something you look at the slogans, you look at what he's doing, what he's saying. He is not using them by mistake. This is not somebody taking a bit of a speech out of context the way that they'll do to Donald Trump and say, well, see, he's using a far right statement just because of some coincidence, some phrasing that actually you can find people on both sides of the political spectrum using very often. A bloodbath. Bloodbath. Yeah, exactly. You know, this is not Donald Trump using the phrase bloodbath and, and then everyone piling in. This is him actually deliberately taking statements that not the slogans that Nazis used and, and using them himself. You know, this is this is becoming much more common. And you see it in you know, like you see it in politics. You see it in these polls. You see it in TikTok videos. You see it on social media. You see it. I wasn't going to go here. I'm going to go. You see it in Tucker Carlson interviewing some insane historian that no one's ever heard of that says Winston Churchill is the bad guy in World War II, as he did this week. Like, there is a spirit all around the world right now. And I saw it a lot this week in German social media, in American social media, that wants to reevaluate that history of World War II. And it's because that same spirit that was there in World War II is rising up again right now. That's why probably on your Twitter feed, you've seen people basically arguing this week, well, the Nazis weren't so bad. And actually it was Britain and Winston Churchill that were the bad guys. That's the spirit that is rising. And Herbert W. Armstrong was saying that spirit would rise again right after World War II. And it seemed unthinkable then, but he thought it and he said it and he said it because of Bible prophecy. So... You know, read Mr. Flurry's article, Nazism Rises Again in Germany. That is a great introduction to this subject and will take you through exactly what these Bible prophecies are saying. I mean, it is, it is, these are key prophecies. These are, well, this is what I'll, I'll, I'll finish in Mr. Mr. Flurry's own words as he concluded that article. It says, prophecy shows the ultimate positive outcome of these events. Daniel 8.25 tells us this strong man will be defeated by Jesus Christ himself. That is what these prophecies are ultimately about. Jesus Christ is preparing to return to earth. Before that, he is going to allow World War III to correct man, but he is ultimately in control. Only Jesus Christ can bring us peace, joy, and happiness forever. This is the best possible news that you could ever fear. I mean, the spirit of World War II and the spirit of Nazism rising again, that's a dark prophecy. But ultimately, as Mr. Flurry said, this is this prop that's what these prophecies are ultimately about. It is all leading to the return of Jesus Christ. And so there's bad news, but you can have some excitement as well, seeing these things that have been prophesied all of these decades ago happen exactly the way that they Bible the Bible said. Because this is leading to a world repenting and a world ruled by jesus christ ushering in peace and prosperity for all well that was a big dark news story for europe i think it's another kind of a dark depressing story without that perspective coming from israel this week as well i think mihailo uh you want to tell us about that yes so on september 1st the idf conduct or israeli defense forces conducted a raid in uh, a tunnel in the area around Rafah, that southern uh, city near the border with Egypt that's been the source of most of the conflict uh, in the last uh, few months. And they found some hostages, but unfortunately, these hostages were dead. Six dead bodies, including Hirsch Goldberg Poland, the, uh, who was one of the abductees from the Supernova Music Festival and famously was featured in one of Hamas's hostage videos from months back. The really tragic thing about this, I mean, obviously in a war, especially this kind of war, people die. But the most tragic thing about this particular death is that look or incident is that it looks like these hostages were executed just days before the IDF came in there. And not only that, but it looks like Hamas or the guards that were there heard that the raid was going to happen and executed those hostages because of that. And then, like the cowards they are, fled the scene. Um, this has gotten a lot of controversy going on in Israel right now. Obviously, again, the death of the hostages is a tragedy, but a lot of people in Israel right now are looking at to what does this mean for the future? Like, the war is dying down, as we've talked about on this program before. 
but Hamas still has a lot of power. It has a lot of power over these individuals' lives. And like a wounded animal, like the wounded animal Hamas is, it is lashing out and using what little power it still has left to maximum pain and maximum controversy as possible. And that was some some tragic. I think when I first saw it, I thought, oh, these hostages were killed in the crossfire or something. But I mean, this is where it could mean more hostage deaths. Like this seems like it's a deliberate shift in strategy from Hamas now, where those hostages that are still alive, they're going to be executed or as Israel pressures them, that that looks like that's that's what Hamas is going to going to do from here on out. And that's provoked a response in Israel. And I think, you know, like some of that is understandable. Israel is in a really, really tough situation. Uh, and so there are hostage family members that are still there in Israel. They don't want to see their loved ones shot. They would rather, some of them, some kind of deal with Hamas that sees their family members released and, and given back. But this has also led to a, a protest movement that others have joined on and amplified that is trying to pressure Israel to compromise, but then also even potentially get rid of Benjamin Netanyahu. Yes. So in the aftermath, you saw a protest similar to ones we saw before with Netanyahu, like say with his judicial reform program and that sort of thing. Those protests have since October 7th been muted, but like once the news broke out of what happened on the First, it was like a trigger. Like the protest organizers estimated, like hundreds of thousands of Israelis came to protest across the streets in various cities, including three hundred thousand in Tel Aviv alone. Whether those numbers are accurate, even if they uh, did inflate those, you could see from video footage that it is massive crowds going to uh, pressure the government to do something. A lot of them, you'll hear them shouting, Akshab, Akshab, which means now, now for a ceasefire. At least the ones in Tel Aviv got a bit rowdy with police. And the organizers of these protests, it does link back to some of the organizers of the previous protests. A lot of people might not realize just from seeing the, the videos on Twitter or X and etc. But these protests were not just spontaneous demonstrations of a tragedy. There's been other tragedies similar like this since the war started, since the ground invasion started. The fact that this one was triggered, and especially at this particular moment, when there are ceasefire negotiations happening between Israel and Hamas and Qatar, according to an anonymous US diplomat that spoke to Turkish media, they're about 90% through those already. The evidence suggests that this is a coordinated attempt to pressure Netanyahu to go on and uh, soften his position, accept more compromise and get a ceasefire going. And you may ask, what kind of compromise are we talking about? Well, the main sticking point that Netanyahu is refusing to budge at this point is the Philadelphia Corridor. Might, a lot of people might have heard that term thrown around the news quite a bit. This narrow strip of land, basically the border between Gaza and Egypt. Netanyahu's position, and rightly so, is that if Israel leaves there for October 7th, when Hamas controlled all of Gaza, that border with Egypt was the way they mainly smuggled in uh, all their weapons and and other resources. It's where they uh, had a large concentration of tunnels. And the Egyptian authorities, of course, knew about those. But at the same time, it didn't want to fight with Hamas. And Netanyahu is saying, if we leave there, um, eight Hamas is going to have a chance to get that access again and rebuild itself and do what it did on October 7th. The whole goal with the ceasefire is to basically get Israel out of Gaza. And for, from Netanyahu's point, you hear people like the, the head of Shin Bet, the domestic security agency, saying that yet leaving the Philadelphia or Philadelphia corridor is on the table when the prime minister himself, who's supposed to be head of the government, is saying the exact opposite. So you're even seeing a division within the Israeli government itself, within those that are conducting negotiations or those privy to the details of the negotiations and the actual leadership where this actually leads to ceasefire negotiations on what would be accepted on where uh, the sticking points are right now is a mystery as far as the public is concerned. But most of the energy right now is focused on the Philadelphia cor corridor and by extension, Israeli troops in Gaza itself. Well, actually, my question was going to be uh, I, these protests, how, how mainstream do you think that like, is this is there genuinely starting to become a, a national movement to get rid of, of Netanyahu, or is this a smaller subset? 
Well, if you're talking about what Israeli society thinks, uh, Jewish News Syndicate conducted a poll, memory serves right side, the 62 or 63% of Israelis, according to their polling, said they support Netanyahu's position on not compromising with Hamas, on not leaving the Philadelphia corridor, on not accepting an, any deal now, no matter what the cost is. But if you're talking about it as a national movement, and if this is start, this is, did not start this week. This was, as I mentioned, a movement that's been gaining uh, momentum for years. October 7th put a lid on that a bit. But it goes without saying either way that there are still hundreds of thousands of Israelis that, for one reason or another, do not like what Netanyahu is doing and are using events like the news we heard from the past weekend as excuses to try and remove, no matter what it is, whether it's this, whether it's the Supreme Court reform, or more news about Netanyahu's never-ending corruption trial, which, if you look at the details, shouldn't be an issue. It's always the same same levels of people, same places, same head organizers doing this over and over again. As far as the international media is concerned, it may all look like spontaneous separate events, but they are all very organized. Yeah, I hadn't seen that, that opinion poll, but that's the point Melanie Phillips made in her article earlier in the week, where she said the ceasefire now protests have been organized by activists, including politicians, former army top brass and intelligence officials who've been trying to leave a Netanyahu out of power for years. And now they're weaponizing the hostages plight to do so. So we're seeing another front in this effort to get rid of Benjamin Netanyahu and I think this is this is this reminds me a little bit of, of the discussion Philip and I had on the previous show where we were talking about all this illegal migration and how okay there's all various different NGOs and globalists and things involved, but really it all traces back to one man, Barack Obama. You can say the same thing about this effort to get rid of Benjamin Netanyahu. Yes. Everything you're seeing with the Joe Biden administration ultimately ties back to Barack Obama. You have a man that many people can see is not fun capable of functionally leading a government, doing all the, making all these radical, often spur of the moment decisions. Uh, his government stack with all former Obama people, Biden himself as a former Obama cabinet member, and they're pursuing the same policies, saying the same things that Obama did when he was officially in power and targeting the same guy that Obama did back, well, all the way back in 2009 when he first became president, as we've talked about in this program before. And it might be a bit, shall I say, Barack Obama so focused on this one man and this one country. Oh, why are so many people under him willing to go forward with that? But you look at the history on what Obama's vision for the Middle East was. A lot of people don't know this. His first phone call with any foreign leader was with Mahmoud Abbas, the Palestinian uh, Authority leader, what he was doing with the Iran nuclear deal. And for all these things of the Middle East, how generally the one man standing up to him, at least on the ground in the Middle East, was Benjamin and is Benjamin Netanyahu. And I think you could tell that Netanyahu and some of his supporters know deep down at least the general direction where this is all coming from. And even from these this particular instance, the day after the the news broke out, Biden was caught walking across uh, the White House lawn, I believe, and reporters asked him if he thought Netanyahu was doing enough to free the hostages. And he just said no. Like in this politically charged time when everybody in Israel is saying all these things, Biden jumped into the fray almost impromptu. Uh, you could, there's, there's enough there to connect the dots, to connect the lines. And Ultimately, it goes back to why Barack Obama and those under him want Netanyahu out of the way. There's something about the state of Israel that he doesn't like. There's something about this a world where Israel is safe and protected that they're trying to undo. And there's something about Netanyahu that sees what's going on and he's standing up in the way. And that's something we wrote about in the Trumpet Print edition. And that's something we had a we had a whole show where we talked a lot about that where Benjamin Netanyahu, in many ways, is sounding a watchman warning about what Iran is doing, and then kind of by extension, some of ben uh, some of Barack Obama's foreign policy and how he is enabling that, and he wants that shut down. And I think also to really understand that, you have to understand that crucial spiritual dimension to this world news, and to understand that God is teaching the world a lesson through the nations of Israel, and he has used these countries in a, in a particular way. And a lot of that lesson is, well, these countries were given a lot of physical resources and disobeying, disobeying God's laws has brought curses and has meant that those physical blessings haven't lasted. 
But there are a lot of good things that have come to the world through these powers, these, these countries. I and mean, the Jews preserved the Old Testament and God's Sabbath and holy days and things like that. And there's just so much of God's plan that throws, flows through those nations. And Satan hates that. There's a real spirit world and he works through individuals. And that's where you get this irrational hatred that Hamas has for Israel. That's where you get the irrational hatred that the radical left has for Israel. And so that Netanyahu trumpet print edition, that other article that we've got, you can you can get more information on that. I think another story that really caught my eye this week from the Middle East was this post from Israel's foreign minister over the weekend that is where uh, he said that huge camps with funds and weapons smuggled through Jordan, aiming at establishing an eastern terror front against Israel. This process also threatens the stability of the Jordanian regime. And Israel Hayom this week is, is saying that the IDF is basically getting ready to go into the West Bank and try and get this clear this area out or get get ready. They're afraid of a terrorist attack during the holy days that are coming up. So they want to deal with the the problem there. But that's, again, you see a, you know, what motivates a country like Iran to say we want to wipe Israel off the map. Like, that's not normal. That is not, not just normal national human self-interest. Hey, we're all competing. and I'm trying to get as much resources for myself as I can. That is motivated by something, by a much deeper hatred. So you see that you see that there. I think you had another couple of stories you wanted to bring us from what's been happening in the in the Middle East this week. Yes, that actually one the first one I want to bring up actually ties in with what you talked about. It's technically from last week. It was an important story. We didn't have time to get to it. But Israel conducted uh its largest raid in the West Bank since at least two decades on August twenty eighth and twenty ninth, at least fourteen militants were killed in different West Bank cities like Janine and uh, Tulkam and some of these other perennial terrorist hotspots. This ties in again with what you said about a second critical front happening. I think the West Bank sort of gotten a bit under the radar with a lot of uh, the coverage that's happening with Gaza and with Lebanon and whatnot. But I mean, that is the big prize for Iran. That's what directly borders uh, Jerusalem, which is why they're fighting Israel in the first place. And it's also a bit of a more of a, a disorganized center for radicalism, I guess you could say. Gaza was structured as a totalitarian state, obviously run by terrorists. But in this case, you have a hotbed of diff all sorts of different competing terror groups that are more, shall we say, inclined to put themselves in ways that would not necessarily leave them alive at the very end. Like more radical population that Iran could work with to cause more problems. Um, so that's something we're definitely going to be watching. Also, a couple of things. On Tuesday, the United States, or rather American federal prosecutors, formally charged Yahya Sinwar as a criminal under U.S. law for promoting terrorism for conspiracy to murder U.S. nationals, which, I mean, again, it's something that easily gets overlooked. A lot of these hostages are dual citizens from different countries. If it was any other uh, country in in the world where some of these guys uh, got hurt, you could you would see the United States and some of these other countries but uh, pushing forward to try and rescue them. But because they happen to be Israel's problem, that's uh, not the case in, uh, for here. The fact that it's taken so long for people to call Yahya Sinwar conspiring to murder U.S. nationals says enough. And just a little update of what we talked about before with Libya. Looks like there is a new chapter in that the uh, the two sides have agreed to nominate a single central bank representative. Last time I checked, they haven't actually put a name. But either way, this saga with oil uh, uh, being cut off from the rest of the world, with the rest of the world being interested in it, depending on who they pick, it might turn into even more fighting. We might see this part of North Africa become more important in the days and weeks to come. Thank you for that, Mohalo. I think we can stick almost with this hatred of Israel theme. I think one of the big pieces of news out of the UK was a shameful story from Britain's new Labour government, where we had this story where six Israeli hostages were murdered, and Britain responded by blocking certain arms to Israel. And they're now going to, they're, re they're refusing to, the Foreign Minister David Lammy announced this, they're refusing to sell certain types of weapons for Israel. And they said it's because there's a high chance that these will be used in war crimes, which is a lie. And it, it's, I mean, this is evil on the level of the Nazis, or worse, potentially. I mean, the Nazis tried, I mean, Hamas is trying to kill all the Jews, just like the Nazis did. They started this fight in October. And now we're saying, well, in this war of good versus evil, we don't really want to support 
support Israel in this. We're not going to fully side with good. We're going to actually refuse to help you in some circumstances right after some of your own people have been murdered. I mean, it's a it's a horrible decision. It reflects this growing hatred of Israel on the left. And I think you see what the Labour Party is doing here. It's classic, almost Tony Blair triangulation. Some people support Israel. Some people of our voters oppose Israel because Labour gets a lot of votes from radical Muslims and things like that. So we'll kind of split the difference and we'll restrict arms sales to Israel and try and keep everyone happy, which it's kept nobody happy, but they're trying to pander to some of their, their constituents there. But uh, Andrew, I think you're going to talk about something similar in the United States where we're seeing the radical left movement sympathizing and siding even more and more with Hamas. Yeah, this really is a global trend. We've talked already on this program about rising anti-Semitism amongst nationalist parties in Germany and Europe more broadly. We've talked about anti-Semitic statements on Twitter, even by some who claim to be conservative in the United States. We've talked about anti-Semitism amongst the Labour Party in Britain. Uh, and there's also a, a deep anti-Semitism taking root in the Democratic Party and leftist here in the United States. Um, we've already covered on this program quite extensively the pro-Hamas protests that rocked universities last school year. Uh, they started right after Hamas's October 7th massacre. Uh, and shut down many universities, caused thousands and thousands of dollars in damage, made it so Jewish students were afraid to even go to class. And that's tamped down a little bit over the summer, not because the anti-Semitism's gotten better, but just because school's out during the summer, it's summer break. Uh, but we had the first week of classes at Columbia University this week, and right on cue, the protest started right back up. We've actually got a news clip I can play right now of um, showing some audio footage of those protests, some vi video footage of those protests, and a Jewish student giving his thoughts on those protests. So yeah, you heard right there this this Jewish student saying nobody- Many students returned to class today, but not without some drama on campus. Protesters covered a statue with red paint, as you can see here. Chopper 2 captured crews cleaning it off as protests unfolded outside the gates. But students we talked to say that it's nothing like the chaos we saw this spring as the previous semester came to a close. Jessica Moore was there speaking with students on both sides of the issue. <laughs> of drum beats and chanting could be heard for blocks as pro-Palestinian demonstrators marched outside Colombia's main gate, demanding the school divest from Israeli businesses. They even doused the alma mater statue with red paint. They're making life unbearable for all Jews on campus. They're making life unbearable for everybody on campus, right? Nobody wants this. Wants this, and of course there are some people who want it because there are some people who are participating in these protests. But they're deeply disturbing because, like I said, you've got these Jewish students who are scared to go to class, and um, because of these overtly pro-Hamas protests, which really shows a disturbing shift in the anti-Semitism here amongst American Democrats. Because the Democratic Party here in the United States has been anti-Israel for decades. However, until very recently, they've always tried to defend their anti-Israelism by saying, we're not anti-Semitic, we're not anti-Jewish, we're anti-Zionist. Our pro-Marxist left-wing ideology makes it so we view the state of Israel as colonial oppressors hurting the indigenous Palestinians. And so that's how they... Like, like if I were to say I'm pro-French, but I'm opposed to France existing as a state, I'm not pro-French. Like it's It makes a, no sense. Completely ridiculous semantic argument there. But sorry, go on. Yeah, so that argument never made any sense. Like every ethnic group on earth other than the Jews had a state. And so the fact that the Jews came back to their historic homeland, they had every right to do that. But these new protests since October 7th are getting more disturbing because the mask has come off. And now you're seeing some of these protests where you're chanting death 
to the Jews. And you've got that Jewish student, like the one you just heard on the uh, that video clip, talking about how Jewish students are scared to go to class. Now, that Jewish student, he's not in Netanyahu's cabinet. He, it's not, he doesn't work for the Israeli government. He's not even an Israeli citizen. He's just an ethnic Jew here in the United States going to Columbia University who's being harassed and threatened despite him having nothing to do with the dispute between the Israelis and the Palestinians in the Middle East simply because he's Jewish. And so it's morphed from what they said it was, which was like a Marxist economic dispute between the colonizers and the colonized. Uh, as they phrase it, to being an outward, an overtly racist ideology that just hates Jewish people. That's even spreading from academia into Congress. Like I said, Netanyahu's speech in Congress a couple few weeks ago, we talked about that, how uh, Kamala Harris and several members of Congress outright boycotted that speech. So you're actually having politicians support this narrative. And it's extremely dangerous. We've actually um, wrote an article in the Trumpet earlier this year uh, titled The Sickness in American Universities. That it was about the protests that are starting up again. Uh, we wrote it last school season when they were really going, uh, going heavy. And we co um, uh, the historian Niall Ferguson comparisons with what happened in Germany. We've talked a lot about Germany already in the 1930s, where he wrote that he said, anyone that has a naive belief in the power of higher education to instill ethnical values has not studied the history of Germany in the Third Reich. A university degree, far from inoculating Germans against Nazism, made them far more likely to embrace it saying that like the Nazis version of Nazism was not like stereotypical, poor, uneducated, racist, just agitating against Jews in Germany, but was actually taught uh, at a philosophical level at the highest levels of German education. And you're, you're seeing the same thing today where the most, uh, I, I'm, there's all sorts of anti-Semitic comments you might be able to find on Twitter, but the most diehard anti-Semitic comments from chanting death to the Jews in America are coming from those at Harvard University, at Yale University, at Columbia University, all the highest echelons of American education. And it's not the students uh, rebelling against their authority, rebelling against their teachers, but it's actually the teachers who are, who are teaching this, teaching that like the, the Palestinians are being oppressed by the Jews. And uh, these students, they've never been to Israel. They, they're completely disconnected from reality as to what's happening over there. But they can parrot what their professors are teaching them uh, and then take to, take to the campus grounds to protest this. Uh, and protest is so violent that you've now got Jewish students like logging into class on Zoom calls from their dormitory because it's literally not safe for them to walk publicly on campus grounds in the United States of America. And it's not just a few kind of vocal ones or radicals or hotheads. Like, I think this is a stunning poll from uh, Harvard Caps Harris. They've been doing this every month or so. The latest one is from July, where they ask, in this conflict, do you support more Israel or Hamas? So not just do you think like it's it's literally which side are you on? Are you with the people that were raping and murdering and killing children on October 7th or the people that were being attacked? And 80 percent of Americans say we were with Israel. Great. Good. But like that's normal mainstream American opinion. And 80 percent, you know, it's kind of hard to get 80 percent of Americans to agree on anything. That's perhaps as close to unanimous as you can get. But you break it down by age and it's a very different picture. So you look, you ask that question to 18 to 24 year olds, 46 percent of those that answered of that age group said, actually, no, I supply it. I, I stand more with Hamas. I think not just not saying, OK, is like I could understand if there was a large majority saying or, or even a large minority saying, well, I don't necessarily agree with everything Israel's doing or I don't think Israel is, is perfect or Maybe I stand with a two-state solution. That's not what the 46% are saying. They're saying 
those people doing rape and murder and kidnap, I stand more with them than I do with Israel. I'm on their side. That's about half of that entire generation. Like that is mind boggling how many of them stand with Hamas and how many more like. I would assume a good chunk of the 56% that say, well, actually, I do stand with more with Israel and maybe not particularly pro-Israel, but they at least draw a line at siding with a terrorist group. And that's how this ties into a prophecy, not just for for Israel. I mean, we've talked about this this uh, prophecy of uh, well, what's prophesied for Israel, the spiritual dimension, how there's an evil spirit world that is turning the world, really, and kind of breaking the brotherhood between Britain and America and Israel, and that was massively on display this week. Uh, but you wanted to talk about even what this means for the United States itself. Right. Well, one of the scriptures I brought with me today was in Hosea 4 and verse 6 that's talking about end time Israel, which is actually includes the United States and Britain, where it says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you. Seeing as you've forgotten the law of your God, I will forget your children. And so this verse, it's really focusing in on an education problem in end time Israel. And, and you've already quoted the statistics that like, if you're just an average American, you're about 80% chance that you support Israel. But if you're a Columbia University student, now all of a sudden you're much more likely to support Hamas. And so this is something where these students are being destroyed from lack of knowledge. And because the leaders, the teachers, the politicians are rejecting God. It's the it's the children, or in this case, like the young adults, the young people who are really suffering for it. Uh, these professors have a lot to answer for because a lot of them, they're educated people. They watch the news. They should know better than to teach the things they're teaching. But if you watch like someone with a, you know, you see those videos with someone with a camera and a microphone just going around to college students asking them basic questions. You'll see shocking things like a gender studies student protesting for Hamas. And then you'll be like, and then they'll point out the contradiction. Like, well, how can you be pro-homosexual and then support an Islamic theocracy that throws homosexuals off roofs? And they don't even know that happens. Uh, so like their their knowledge of what's happening in Israel is abysmal. They've just been fed this propaganda. Their, their, their teachers are spoon, fe spoon feeding them, uh, pouring this funnel in their head. And like I said, it's not just a rebellion against the Jews. It's a rebellion against Western civilization itself uh, being driven primarily by the media and academia. So the people really are being destroyed from lack of knowledge. Uh, it's definitely already destroying the Jewish people's hopes and dreams and safety. Uh, but the spirit behind it is spreading into the United States as well, to where once you've, once you've rejected the Judeo-Christian values the U.S. Constitution is based on, like the American people themselves have no chance of actually living in a free society. It's going to be replaced with a dictatorship. And you you dig into this a little bit. I don't want to get too much detail here, but it's uh, some of these uh, groups that are sponsoring the protests, like Shut, Shut It Down for Palestine is one of them, who's actually receiving money directly from the Chinese Communist Party. So the Chinese Communist Party knows that they fund these groups that are rebelling against Western civilization. That's going to be in their interest in the long term. Well, thank you for that, Andrew. Very briefly to leave at least a little bit of time for Jeremiah. I think there are a few other stories you wanted to talk about from the US. Yeah, a couple other disturbing things, just showing the degradation of the rule of law here in America. We've got the mayor of Aurora, Colorado, that's a suburb near Denver, has confirmed that Venezuelan gangs of illegal immigrants have taken over several apartment complexes driven the landlords from the premises and are now extorting rent from the tenants directly, uh, just showing the, the continued curses of illegal immigration in America. Uh, also, we had stock prices fall sharply again on new economic data on weak manufacturing, showing that the um, America's runaway debt and out of control consumer spending manufacturing problems are still pushing the nation closer and closer to recession day by day. And then uh, another big defeat for free speech 
is a Brazilian judge, which is a, a country in the Americas, has finally banned Elon Musk's social media platform uh, X from the country, showing that that's a huge defeat for uh, free speech in Brazil by someone who succeeded at doing what many bureaucrats in the American government want to do uh, and just censor any opinion they don't agree with. And there's a lot of that censorship going on more and more around the world. Well, we'll finish up now with Jeremiah that with a story that is quite a, a striking and specific example of fulfilled Bible prophecy. Yes, that's right. The big story this week is that India has been secretly selling Russia a wide range of sanctioned electronics, which help Russia continue its war against Ukraine. So this was revealed in some leaked documents this week. The documents detail the way India and Russia hid this from the United States and Europe since the US and Europe have banned transferring electronics with military applications to Russia. And this was electronic equipment that India would actually buy in Western markets and then secretly sell to Russia through back channels. It's mainly parts for servers and telecommunications equipment and other complex electronics. And it all has military applications. And the numbers show that this is a massive scandal. The value of these goods that India has been selling to Russia comes out to about $12 million worth. And that's only for part of the time frame. It appears to have been going on for longer than just that specific time frame. So these are very significant quantities. These are quantities that are enough to tip the scales on the battlefield. And this comes at a time when India is trying to portray itself as being, you know, a close partner to the United States and more of a supporter of international law. But now we're seeing that at the same time that India tries to portray itself in those sort of Western friendly ways, it has been secretly enabling Russia's war. So this shows that despite some of those appearances to the contrary, India is a close friend to Russia. And India is a big part of the reason why Russia is bringing so much destruction and tension into the world. And that is, that is a specific forecast of Bible prophecy where Mr. Furry, Herbert W. Armstrong before him was saying, forecasting that there would be an alliance between India and Russia. And America has worked hard to try and have a relationship with India. I think even bending some of the rules on the nuclear non-proliferation treaty and, uh, and things like that, trying to court India. But we're seeing that prophecy fulfilled where India is increasingly siding with Russia. That's right. Yes. On Trumpet World, we often talk about a 200 million man army of Asian soldiers that is prophesied about in the book of Revelation. The scriptures show that this mighty Asian army will be one of the one of the main belligerents in World War III. And we have a booklet called Russia and China in Prophecy that goes into detail about all the various Bible passages that discuss this future Asian force. It, it takes a close look at a passage in Ezekiel 38, verses 1 through 2, which show that this massive force will be led by Russia with China in a position of junior leadership. And then verse 5 of that chapter actually lists some ancient names for the peoples that mainly make up modern India. And it says that they will also be part of this end-time Russia-led bloc. So when we see India today drawing closer to Russia and, and quietly defying the West in order to enable Russia's war, that's really building the foundation for India to take its part in this Russia-led Asian army. And of course, since India's population is so huge, even larger than China's now, we can see how India will play a big role in bringing this end-time force up to that unprecedented, unfathomable number of 200 million soldiers as well. And the rise of that Asian alliance is one of the key, key signposts for us in watching Asian news. And you have a few other stories to bring to our attention along those lines. I do, yes. First up, a Chinese spy infiltrated the highest levels of government in New York State. This story broke on Tuesday, and it's about a Chinese woman named Linda Sun. She was an aide to both former New York Governor Andrew Cuomo and current Governor Kathy Hochul. 
And the charges say that she's been acting as an undisclosed Chinese government agent. And it's very sobering because Sun used her position in government to build close ties between these New York politicians and the Chinese Communist Party. Um, and she also blocked Taiwanese officials from being able to access US authorities. In one case, she even secretly added a Chinese government official onto a private conference call between US officials. And there are many details that we still don't know about everything that this Chinese spy did from her position of power to further the interests of the Chinese Communist Party and just to hurt the United States. But this is more evidence of just how thoroughly infiltrated by China America now is. And then next up, a development with Russian President Vladimir Putin. He traveled to Mongolia on Tuesday to meet with Mongolia's leaders. Normally, this wouldn't be anything notable, but Mongolia is a signatory to something called the Rome Statute. And that statute governs the International Criminal Court. And you might recall that about 18 months ago, the International Criminal Court issued a warrant for Vladimir Putin's arrest. That was because of Putin's role in deporting Ukrainian children to Russia. Um, that is a war crime and Putin's role in it is easily proven. So the international court really has a rock solid case here. And Mongolia, as a signatory nation, was obligated to arrest him as soon as he, really as soon as he set foot on Mongolian territory so that he could be handed over to the court. But instead of handcuffs, it was red carpet. Mongolian authorities held, you know, held a bunch of meetings with him, with this war criminal, and they even feted him. So this shows that international law is in just a contemptible state. These laws and courts, they were designed to promote world peace. But since there's no real way to enforce the law or, or even to compel members to follow through on their obligations, it's all very ineffective. And it's just one more indication of the profound problems with mankind's attempts at ruling himself. And then I also have to squeeze in one other short story here, also about Vladimir Putin. On Thursday, he came out and said he backs Kamala Harris in the upcoming U.S. presidential election. And the reason he gave is that he likes Harris's laugh. He called it expressive and infectious. So, wow, you know, we're... we're We've learned that Putin is a big fan of mirthful musical laughs. He's a jolly soul with no concern for geopolitical <laughs> implications, or so we're suddenly supposed to believe. But of course, in reality, Vladimir Putin is a KGB mastermind. He knows how most Americans perceive him, and he knows very well how this endorsement is likely to be received by many American voters. Well, at least there's someone that likes Kamala Harris's laugh, even if it is Vladimir Putin. Well, thank you very much for that, Jeremiah. And as you finished up with there, really, I mean, this world needs some form of functioning international government. It needs something to bring peace to the world. Not, not in the way that, that say, the globalists and, and those friends of Barack Obama, people like George Soros kind of talk about it. But if you go to prevent human annihilation and bring peace to the world it needs some system to restrain human nature to enforce law and bring peace and that is really what all of these different prophecies that we've talked about this week are all about i mean to conclude with those words from mr flurry from his nazis and rules again in germany article that is what these prophecies are ultimately all about jesus christ is preparing to rule return to earth all of these different events that you see all around you, this is the crisis at the close. This is the end of man ruling over man. And these prophecies are there showing you that God knows what's happening, that God is allowing all of this to happen. And very soon he's going to forcefully intervene. In many ways, he's intervening already. And it's going to lead to God's world government all over the earth. That is about all we've got time for, but we'd love for you to study into that in more detail. We'll have notes to all of the major pieces of literature and articles that we have mentioned on this show. Thank you so much for our panel members for joining us. Thank you to George Haddad and Isaac Lorenz for engineering and production. If you have any questions or comments, you can get in touch with us at trumpetworld at thetrumpet.com, or you can leave us a comment on YouTube or Rumble. You can give us a 
thumbs up or a follow, all of that uh, we do really appreciate. We'll be back on Wednesday. And until then, keep watching your world. 